Well, thank you uh, very much, Elizabeth. And um, uh, what I'm going to try and do for you now is to build on uh, the, uh, the drug hypersensitivity program, the extraordinary drug hypersensitivity program that Liz has told you about that she champions and drives. And as you can see, the initial focus was really the, from the, uh, the drug hypersensitivity clinical practical point of view of patients with drug hypersensitivity. But what I'm going to try and do for you now is to uh, draw lessons from this incredible experiment of man, as Elizabeth says, and, 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 uh, and uh, pose the question as to how far these principles might apply to other areas of medicine. Uh, and, uh, and and how we might generalize what, what we've learned from this. So um, just to remind you, uh, uh, when we were taught about hypersensitivity as medical students, it was defined, it's defined as an excessive immune response causing tissue damage or, or severe systemic syndrome like uh, bacterial hypersensitivity. And these exquisitely uh, specific probes, uh, like the back of here, as you saw on those structural studies, that probe the HLA-B5701 molecule and then elicit a phenomenally strong immune response can teach us about an excessive immune response. Um, and uh, similarly, as I'll, sh I'll show you some very nice work from uh, Lloyd Sonia, who works here with Franz Klaus and colleagues in, in Leiden in the Netherlands, have nicely shown that similar mechanisms operate uh, to uh, induce rejection of mismatched or transplanted organs. And so we can think about these experiments and then ask the question, to what degree could these same models apply to autoimmunity? Uh, typically in autoimmunity we think of a post-translational modification of some protein uh, and uh, creating a, a sea of potential foreignness, uh, but only a proportion of individuals uh, that do that will actually get uh, will get the autoimmune disease, much as we've heard drug hypersensitivity. And similarly, you can think of uh, allergy as, a, as a, a severe, excessive immune response to allergens that uh, also uh, can induce uh, 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 tissue damage or harm to the patient. Now, that's on the side of an excessive immune response. Paradoxically, some of the central problems we face uh, in, in vaccinology, infectious disease and other areas relate to uh, being unable to direct a strong immune response to the targets we want. And uh, this is exemplified by uh, essentially uh, a timeout that's been called on the vaccine developments in HIV, AIDS and TB to, in, in a sense uh, to, to take stock and say that the previously successful approaches that have typically resulted in successful vaccines are just not working for the most adaptable uh, bacteria, protozoa, viruses, and cancers. And so we have to address the fundamental scientific obstacles to this. And the two uh, priorities that have been uh, listed as part of this human vaccine project is proposed to be about it. $5 billion project, a collaborative endeavor over 10 years uh, that involves multiple partners from industry, uh, academia, and government. Um, the priorities will be to understand and harness the phenomenon of immunodominance. And now that term has been used a couple of times, and I'll have to stop and explain, try and explain what we mean by that. There are several meanings of the term, and it's used differently by different people. Uh, and also uh, to characterize the Immune, immune, uh, if you like, uh, the entire telephone book of uh, the B and T cell uh, responses that man can make. Now, of course, uh, as, uh, as people interested in HLA, our first point about this is, well, we may all inherit the, the entire machinery, the T cell diversity generating machinery to make a T cell a T cell receptor to almost anything, and similarly we can rearrange immunoglobulin receptors on our B cells to recognize almost anything and make almost any antibody you might care to want. But the first thing that we do, uh, in both phylogeny and ontogeny, it's the HLA molecules that select 
those um, uh, those uh, T cells that uh, uh, that are restricted by the HLA alleles that we inherit from our mother and father. So while as a population level we have this incredible diversity of HLA, we actually only use a very very limited number of alleles to shape our particular T cell response. And that of course protects us because we're all going to respond differently to a pathogen. That's great in terms of our population level uh, protection against a pathogen, but it can become a diabolical problem when you're trying to design a vaccine uh, to cover the entire population. And so it's, these are the critical issues that we have to um, uh, tackle uh, in the uh, endeavor to uh, correctly direct a, a strong immune response to the targets we want and avoid the decoys that the virus is <coughs> Uh, organism will throw at us. And often if you uh, get a group of scientists working on vaccines together, unfortunately we're rather inclined to divide into uh, silos of uh, those of us who work more on T cells and those of us that work more on B cells. And being someone that uh, particularly thinks about HLA, um, I'm constantly uh, focused on this interaction here, the MHC interactions, and in sort of trying to arbitrate between those who are passionate about T cells and those who are passionate about the B cells, I make the point that the MHC is really at the center of the uh, uh, initial uh, elicitation of a T helper response, and a T helper response is uh, uh, you almost always, uh, very few antibody responses we care about in vaccinology are T cell independent. So you need this MHC uh, T helper cell interaction and similar to B cell, it's MHC class 2 that interacts with, uh, uh, with the uh, T cell. So um, at the heart of this, uh, HLA and the T cells uh, are required for a, uh, a B cell response. So what uh, does the term immunodominance mean? Um, uh, uh, one way of thinking about this is if you think about all of the peptides that one might find in a pox virus, uh, shown here, um, about uh, only about 35,000 of these would the, um, uh, the peptides be, the, uh, particular peptides be available, and only 30,000 would actually be transported into the endoplasmic reticulum, of which only about 150 would bind the particular class one alleles that the uh, that the individual had inherited from the mother and father. And then a subset of that would the T cells uh, recognize those peptides. And then for reasons we don't understand, uh, about 50 of those peptides might elicit an immune response. So the problem is right now we have no deterministic way of predicting an individual which epitopes <laughs> they will respond to. And another way of looking at this uh, sort of way in which infectious disease physicians will often use the term immunodominance at a population level is uh, if you, for example, take even our most immunodominant epitope, and this would probably be one of the most immunodominant epitopes, this uh, EBV, uh, B5701 restricted epitope, BSV shown here, about 83% of individuals with 5701 would make that response. And, uh, and then a lower percentage of individuals will make these other B5701 restricted responses. And again, if you have a patient with B5701 who's been infected with EBV, there's no way of predicting uh, which uh, of those epitopes uh, they respond to, even in this context of highly, highly immunodominant uh, responses. So how, how did we all fall into this? Um, here in Perth, we, uh, when we were uh, looking um, at uh, HIV-related clinical problems that are shown on this uh, graph, um, we were dealing with the clinical priorities of the time. And uh, you know, as translational physicians, we were uh, focused on the scientific questions that were relevant to those uh, problems of the time. Uh, I have to say these problems, the one thing we learned from HIV is that uh, breathtaking progress was made, but this was always a collective endeavor. 
and 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 uh, this this is very much uh, team science. Uh, but uh, uh, really, in very rapid succession, we uh, HIV became a, a chronic manageable disease, and then the convenience and tolerability of drugs was improved, uh, and then we found ourselves trying to uh, deal with this problem of back of the sensitivity. Uh, that taught us uh, uh, many of the lessons that Elizabeth has just uh, uh, taken you through. And uh, the one thing that we, we think is, is important to draw from this extraordinary progress, and not the specific examples of the fact that we were doing 701, but I think what was very powerful from, from this learning exercise were these translational roadmaps. It taught us really what was required, the enormity of the task, to get a genetic test into use globally. And this was a wonderful accomplishment of a partnership between industry, um, academia, and thousands of uh, investigators and patients around the world. Um, it opens up the next frontier, which is preclinical screening drugs before they're used in man. And as I'm about to tell you, it, it really teaches us the roadmaps for the investigation of heterologous immunity with broader implications. So just to very quickly state through uh, some of the material Elizabeth's already taken us through, but really now with an eye to what does, does this teach us about other forms of potential heterologous immunity. <coughs> As you mentioned, the pre-existing models of drug hypersensitivity when we entered this was either with a drug covalently bound and formed a stable uh, epitope that was recognized uh, by, the, uh, by the T cells, or the uh, PI concept uh, that was advanced by Bernard Pickler and his colleagues was that non-covalent binding directly to either the TCR or the MHC without the involvement of peptide was responsible for the reaction. And uh, way back when we first made these associations, we knew that B57 had a deep hydrophobic F pocket and that the uh, side chain of the ninth amino acid was typically uh, typically a tyrosine or phenyl amyline of large cyclic group that sat in this pocket. Uh, and uh, we noticed that uh, here are a variety of, uh, of B5701 uh, restricted uh, epitopes. And we notice they all have this phenyl amyline or tyrosine at the ninth position uh, for a variety of different proteins. And we notice that the back of it looks similar to um, uh, the cyclic side chain. So we wondered whether this was uh, 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 covalently binding, a la the Hapton hypothesis, uh, uh, to a uh, cell peptide, and that was what was being presented. Uh, and, and this was, uh, you know, Elizabeth was on this uh, paper back here where we proposed this model using the, uh, uh, the, the best uh, models of the time. But as she sh showed you subsequently, then uh, they actually looked for that sort of covalent binding, you couldn't find it. But when you added a back of to B5701 uh, 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 homozygous cell lines, you could see this rapid shift with a back of with a decrease in phenylalanine and tyrosines and an increase in short aliphatic side chains, uh, a, a, a marked change in the whole repertoire of peptides that were being presented. So in effect, this was like turning P57 into a completely foreign HLA molecule, much like would happen if you put a mismatched organ into an individual where you put a foreign HLA in. But you're temporarily creating foreign HLA, you're temporarily creating the situation of a mismatched organ while you have high drug levels, but not otherwise. And uh, as Elizabeth said, these three papers came out, and once this knowledge was available, three different crystal structures were found, all of which uh, showed that Bacavir was non-covalent binding with the peptide overlying uh, the uh, binding of, uh, of, of Bacavir here with these non-covalent bonds uh, to both the HLA underneath and to the peptide overlying. Uh, and you can see these non-covalent bonds. Uh, and that uh, explained quite a bit of the, the uh, clinical syndromes. So it nicely explained why the interaction was so specific to 5701 and the high negative predictive value of the uh, test, why screening worked so well. Uh, and it also nicely explained why patients would get this dose-related escalation of symptoms 
and the symptoms would suddenly disappear as soon as the drug levels fell, presumably because that non-covalent binding of the bacteria allowed the a bacteria to immediately fall off the uh, HMO molecule. Uh, it also, for me, you know, was a very important uh, observation, was it really nicely explains that you don't create a stable B-cell uh, epitope, and therefore there is nothing for a B-cell immunoglobulin receptor to see uh, to, to, to make an antibody to. And I think this has got implications for autoimmunity, uh, where we divide things into two buckets, where it's purely T-cell mediated versus the ones where antibody uh, is present. So I think that's an important clue for us to uh, take hold of. The very important is, as was said, that the issue is what's not explained, and that is that uh, the, the specific clinical manifestations, why has it become, as it been caused, the skin syndrome? Whereas 57 with the back of it causes a systemic syndrome, B57 with fluproxacillin causes a hepatotoxicity. Also, the very early onset, it's far too early to be a naive response, in some, at least in some patients. And importantly, this, this great variability, how it can be that some individuals have the HLA but don't get the reaction. That has to be accounted for. And when you look at the, uh, the plethora of HLA associations that follow that are shown here, you can see this wildly varying uh, positive predictive value that Elizabeth talked about down to this tiny positive predictive value here um, uh, for, for flucoxacillin. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's where we need to have a, another model to extend the models that explain how the drug binds to the HLA. So with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, this is a, a tragic condition. As you know, these target lesions uh, that are seen in herpes simplex erythema multiforming look somewhat similar to the target lesions seen in, in, in toxic epidemic necrolysis with SGS. And it's a, a, a large body of very nice work, much of it is done by uh, the, the Taiwanese group, Wen Tang Chung and Xuan uh, Yu. And, um, and, uh, and what they've uh, shown is that CD8 T cells uh, uh, in the, uh, 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 react in the cytokinetic to keratinocytes that have B1502 on their surface. A very important concept that, uh, that is very relevant to this is the concept of tissue resident T cells, which is relatively recent knowledge. Um, and um, these tissue resident T cells have a unique phenotype and they spend their life in the skin. These are very nice images which I've produced, uh, produced by Scott Bueller and uh, Frank Carboni uh, who work on a, um, a mouse model of HSP. And you can see these tissue resident T cells here in the epidermis uh, going through, these are CD8 T cells. The CD4 effective memory cells are going rapidly circulating through the dermis here in green, whereas these, uh, uh, these cells are interrogating the epidermal cells. And you get a sense of this interrogation as you see this uh, tissue resin T cell squeezing through the basement member, through the, if you like, the cement between the pavement stones of the epidermis, reaching out with their dendritic processes and interrogating every cell, hunting for uh, any clue of reactivation of HSV or, or potentially we think the same thing probably applies to the blue hex in the cells we can looking for VZV in the epidermis. And if it sees its target, then they're very aggressive and cause rapid damage and uh, are very easily triggered. Now interestingly, in humans, uh, uh, CD8 alpha alpha cells have been shown, tissue resident TB alpha cells have been shown that are also very easily triggered to HSV2. This is work from collaborators in, in Seattle, uh, Larry Corey's group, uh, uh, David Corral and others, uh, done this very elegant work showing these uh, cells in, in humans. And so, uh, and then interestingly, we find the same uh, T cell receptors uh, that are responding to HSV uh, appear in the blister fluid of uh, patients with uh, SGS TN. So, uh, the model, as Elizabeth explained, is that. Uh, at some earlier point, uh, herpes uh, infection has uh, triggered this particular TCR, and that TCR, when the later, when the patient is exposed to drug here, uh, 
somehow, I'm not quite sure how the neohepatope is created, but we think that this TCR mistakes the carbazepine on 1502 to induce this very severe uh, epidermal uh, necrolysis. And, um, and so uh, this model of heterologous immunity, uh, we think may uh, be relevant, not just to drug hypersensitivity, but to other syndrome, syndromes. Now, just to make a point, this uh, heterologous immunity is, is a well-known phenomenon, and general was being thought of to be beneficial to the host to have plasticity of the T cells that cross-react with uh, from one infection to the other. And there are numerous examples. I just want to point out to you that you can't pick these examples by uh, any kind of homology uh, with the uh, amino acids. There's no way you could do blossom pots or any bioinformatic approach that would give you a clue just on the basis of residues that this response to some battle cross-reacted with this flu response. Uh, and that's part of the, the, the challenge in this area. So in organ transplantation, uh, uh, very, very elegant work has been done for many years. Scott Burroughs and colleagues uh, in, in Melbourne, Queensland have done very, very elegant work in this area. Uh, and uh, the classic example from uh, many years ago, as you can see here in 1994, is the example of uh, HLA-B8. So if, if someone in the room has HLA-B8, and has EBV infection, they're, they're almost certain to create this uh, EBV uh, T cell response to the FLR epitope on, um, uh, that's present in EBV. And those CD8 T cells help contain the EBV infection. Now, if we were to put a B4402 kidney into that individual, assuming they didn't have B4402 themselves, uh, then what would happen is that those T cells that were designed to see EBV would reject the B4402 kidney. And um, th th they really thoroughly investigated this, this, this uh, fantastic example. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Lloyd and colleagues, uh, Franz Klaus in, uh, in, in Leiden, picked up on this. And um, that they, they make the point that, of course, memory T cells have a much lower threshold to be triggered that have much lower requirements for either CD4 help or, or co-stimulation and are, are typically uh, loaded with uh, cytolytic capacity. So what they did was they used these uh, 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 tetramers that were already available, for example, the tetramer to the EVV FLR epitope, and single cell sorted those uh, cells and they cloned, and then looked for cross-reactivity against foreign HLA alleles, and either using panels of EBV LCLs or single antigen lines. And uh, it is, however, they do the, the work. They uh, take, for example, that uh, uh, tetramer I mentioned, someone with B8, uh, tetramer sort their cells that have the, that, uh, making that response to EBV, and then put them in single cell uh, well format, make clones, uh, T cell clones. And then when you look at those T cell clones cross reactivity, you can see that a, a class one null line that's been transfected with 4402 uh, responds a uh, 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 single antigen line uh, will uh, trigger a gamma interferon response. And you can do this with uh, panels. So the short of this body, large body of work is Time and time again, they found that it was a, a response, a class 1 mediated response to a herpes virus that was cross-reacting <laughs> with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, foreign HLA. And this is a very common phenomenon. So uh, really, the transplant literature and the drug hypersensitivity literature to support themselves. And they went on to very elegant structural work where they investigated this famous uh, CD, uh, CDL clone to FLR called LC13. And uh, they compared, they've got the structure of the, uh, uh, the authentic response to the real EBV epitope and the structure of the uh, allo response uh, restricted by 4402. Uh, here you can see the MHC molecule and the uh, epitope uh, sticks a tyrosine at P7 position up here in the solvent interface. And the T cell receptor LC13 uh, uh, interrogates and, and sees that. 
And if you look here at the solvent interface of the um, of the uh, B cell uh, of the uh, of the HLA molecule, this is what the T cell would see looking down, and this is what it looks like looking up at the T cell receptor. So this is like a sandwich. If you put these together, you can imagine this uh, blue region will uh, fold, will, will see this blue, this purple. Uh, this purple region and, and this blue, this blue, and so forth, and you can see that the pocket that the uh, P7 tyrosine uh, sits up here, out of the solvent interface here, is accommodated by the uh, uh, lc 30 antibody uh, T cell receptor. And if you look at the surface of uh, the uh, authentic uh, uh, virotype here in B8, the EBV epitope here is sitting in B8 compared to the endogenous peptide sitting in B4402. You can see that there are regions of difference. However, when you look at how the TCR sits, those regions are not interrogated by the TCR. So you can understand now at the structural level why this TCR would mistake these two uh, to, to um, uh, um, uh, distinct HLA molecules. It makes the point that the way the HLA molecule sits across the, the TCR sits across the HLA molecule in a classic diagonal uh, 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 orientation only interrogates part of uh, the solvent interface. And if there are differences or changes outside that area, then there's opportunity for mistaken identity. Now, mistaken identity, I must emphasize, is not the only mechanism. Other mechanisms have been demonstrated, like the TCR sitting in different uh, orientations or bulldozing things down. There are a variety of things. But basically, we're increasingly understanding the plasticity of the T cell response, which, is, of course, has evolved, we think, for uh, our benefit. So uh, making mistakes is inherent and important part of why, why T cells, TCRs have been affected. So why, what's all this, why do things keep coming back to the therapies viruses? Um, here, uh, just this slide just illustrates the huge burden of, uh, of uh, uh, chronic uh, uh, DNA viruses. And, and, and of the nearly 7 billion of us on the planet, we typically all harbor about 8 to 12 chronic uh, infections, most of which are DNA viruses. And I make the point that the herpes viruses are special. That we've been co-evolving with herpes viruses for hundreds of millions of years. And essentially, each herpes virus attaches its survival to a particular species. If human beings die, so do the human herpes viruses. They're completely committed to us, much like the mitochondria that you all have are committed to you. And we, I think we need to, we're starting to think about the herpes viruses, at least some proteins within the herpes viruses, in a much more symbiotic uh, type of way. Um, so, uh, for example, um, uh, and, and if we now switch to thinking about how MHC has evolved in, its, in, in parallel, uh, we know that HLA-A like this is older and B duplicated relatively recently, and particularly is good at targeting RNA viruses. And what we've done here is to line up the evolution of herpes viruses with the evolution of uh, class one uh, uh, um, molecules going back through uh, primate evolution and so forth. And you can see that A and B, uh, B duplicated out of A and then uh, C out of B. Uh, and really, it's in a fairly parallel time course that initially we had the systemic viruses, E, B, C, and B, HHV6. And more recently, uh, the uh, tissue resident uh, viruses, uh, HSV1, HSV2, BZB. Uh, and importantly, uh, these uh, tissue resident viruses, for example, HSV2, uh, is thought to have uh, uh, been in our chimp ancestor, the split of chimps and man. Uh, in the form of H our ancestral form of HSV1 took a vacation from us, a holiday from us, uh, from about six five or six million years ago to about one and a half million years ago, and then it passed back from chimps into us as HSV2. And that was enough to, to, to shape it and change it in, in subtle ways. Um, so we're all familiar with the gun steel and germs type ideas of urbanization 50,000 years ago and the plethora of RNA viruses that we've dealt with. 
and the idea of the hygiene hypothesis. And really, as an extension of the hygiene hypothesis, we think that later onset of uh, herpes viruses is really very much part of what happens as you as you uh, in, uh, become more developed, and, and and may shift in the dominance hierarchy substantially. Um, I want to emphasize, although I'm putting this emphasis on DNA viruses as shaping our immune responses uh, in evolutionary terms, it's not like the RNA viruses haven't always been around. The HLA molecules in the T cell and B cell machinery are also evolving, co-evolving to target the conserved and recorded messages in RNA viruses. It's just that the DNA viruses are much more uh, in, in synergy, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a synergistic relationship with us, and the RNA viruses are trying to earn a living, ducking rapidly between species more often. So, um, with EBV infection, as you know, if you acquire it very early in life, it's usually asymptomatic. In the Western world, when we typically acquire it as an adolescent, we uh, re-stimulate a lot of heterologous responses and get activated T cells that make us very sick. And many examples of these heterologous uh, responses have been demonstrated now. Uh, but just to remind you, too, that uh, EBV is a particularly challenging uh, uh, thing for the immune system to contain because it it's uh, latent niches in the uh, memory B cells, and you have to have CD4 and 8 uh, T cells keeping this in check. Um, if you kill them all, then you'd lose your B cells and you would got them. If you didn't contain them, you'd be able to long by lymphoma. So it's a very nuanced balance. And, it, and it's really quite extraordinary when you look at the uh, epitopes that uh, are uh, uh, presented by EBV. It's the a very early and the immediate IE and the early epitopes, and the earlier the protein is expressed, uh, the uh, more uh, uh, the better the class one restricted uh, CDA T cell responses are. Uh, so this really looks like coevolution hand in hand. Uh, you could say the same thing for PP65, an important protein in CMB. It's produced in very high amount early on by the virus and provides a lot of important CD8 epitopes. And uh, really the, the role, if you like, talking teleologically for the virus is to present these epitopes and allow the host to contain the CMB to avoid it overwhelming the host in primary dissemination. And so we can think more about these epitopes as potentially these conserved virotopes early in life uh, that are chronically uh, a chronically persist in the individual that, if you like, are a natural postnatal form of vaccination, and you could speculate that perhaps some of the behaviors uh, have been driven by uh, the protection that gives a particular species of primates uh, with their own herpes uh, to uh, circulate birds at an early age. Now, quickly to finish off, we did some, uh, we we're lucky to work with uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, 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 Austria Josich and Tatma Hertz and others. Uh, Elizabeth was involved in this work and many here, um, where we looked at the, um, uh, the conservation of, uh, of viruses. So here we're looking at HIV, SIV, FIV, and we worked out a conservation score of every amino acid and related that to binding scores. So here, for example, as part of HSB, you can see the binding of uh, HLA uh, A24 tracks very well with conservation. So we would call this, you see this sort of nice correlation, <laughs> good target. This is what you want in an allele. You wanted to see what was conserved and functionally important. And that should be that should be an effective response there to that bit of, uh, of, of, of herpes simplex. And when we did this for all of the uh, all of the viruses here, here we've got all of the DNA viruses lined up, the RNA viruses, and so forth, and did it for all the HLA class 1 binders, and then compared it in this column with the binding to the human proteome, you can see a few things stand out initially. Firstly, uh, that the HLA-A allele, remember these are older, uh, target uh, um, uh, uh, human proteins well. Um, and also, intriguingly, B5758, which is thought to be old and ancestral, maybe an old ancestral form of the of, uh, of uh, an A allele that uh, potentially here also developed the 
uh, ability to target RNA virus as well. And from that ancestor then, uh, HLA-B alleles appear to have sub-specialized and are targeting the RNA virus as well here. And intriguingly, there are some exceptionally diabolical viruses here which are using that external flexible bits, it would appear, to, uh, uh, to actually exploit this and re-stimulate, uh, which we assume, um, more immunodominant responses to uh, that are shaped by human proteins and herpes viruses. And, and this shows that the very same alleles, A2, A3, G57, 58, etc., up here, that target human proteins well, target CMV very well, and actually have very high negative uh, 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 um, target efficiency to dengue. So this suggests that the RNA viruses are throwing up these decoys in the plastic bits and directing the immune response to where it wants the immune response to buy some time uh, uh, to allow the infection to become established. And obviously this is uh, with, with doing experimental work which is, is, is um, uh, uh, supporting these sort of models and, uh, and we think is relevant to vaccine uh, development. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, I wanted to leave you with a, a thought that T-cell cross-reactivity is common, is involved for good reasons, generally beneficial for the host, but there's a price to pay that we see in terms of either natural or, or man-known forms of hypersensitivity, uh, and, that, um, and that the roadmap that uh, the drug hypersensitivity <coughs> and transplant work has provided has given us a roadmap to investigate other forms of hypersensitivity, particularly for pathogenesis studies, and then opens up the possibility of personalizing monitoring of those therapies. So how might that be done in operational terms? Typically what we do, and we found many clinical champions either in multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and closing spondylitis, even hypertension turns out to be a T-cell mediated disease, I think. Um, and uh, many of those diseases have HLA associations, but the mechanisms are not known uh, how this HLA association translates to mechanistic understanding. Essentially, the uh, roadmap that Elizabeth provided from, from her sort of studies, take the HLA B57 positives, find those with hypersensitivity, do a adjunctive patch test, get to the TCR um, you know, sequence, do single cell TCR working, uh, get them into a TCR transfectoma system, show the cross reactivity, uh, and then uh, have the appropriate controls, namely those of the B5701 who do not develop the disease. So we can do that, and particularly like at uh, with Vanderbilt, there is a huge resource in the BioView platform where nearly 2 million uh, electronic medical records have been uh, linked with um, what's now 200,000 DNA samples uh, to look at again, against any kind of phenotype that you want. We've recently done uh, 4,000 uh, HLA targets in view, and we also find that we can include the HLA from the genome chip data um, uh, as well. So this gives enormous power to uh, really uh, confirm DNA uh, HLA associations and then using the PREDICT system and, and, and our clinical champions follow this roadmap to uh, characterize the pathogenesis of these different autoimmune diseases. Another area with Tina Harvard is uh, RSV and asthma which is a pretty very uh, useful area. So the, the general approach that's come out of these experiments in Miami are shown here, the clinical champion, high resolution typing, TCL beep sequencing, organism beep sequencing, all those technologies you see. Very importantly now, a TCR a single cell work, uh, Mark Davis and his group have very generously helped us get these assays going. And if you're on the tour, we'll be able to show you some of these how, how these uh, technologies have been uh, brought uh, uh, into Australia um, uh, through the generous collaboration of uh, our US colleagues. Um, and finally, uh, of course, it, it's always good to get the structural studies. So uh, we've been very fortunate to have this collaboration between Vanderbilt and ourselves. Uh, we have, a, if you like, a small franchise of, of the exact same infrastructure you'll see here at the Institute established in Vanderbilt in the translation of non-infectious disease. Uh, and we also, I also have the role as director, uh, deputy director of the, of the uh, genetics core there. Uh, and uh, we've been also uh, very uh, warmly um, uh, uh, 
helped and, 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 and we've been collaborating even deeply with the cancer centre there uh, and uh, uh, we're hoping to facilitate an uh, ongoing exchange between the US and Australia uh, with uh, first last notice in the cancer space and that's partly the reason for uh, the, 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 the agenda that's to follow. So uh, many people to thank, I hope I thank them uh, on the way through, but essentially a scientist, we're a community of thieves. If you recognize your own ideas in here, that they probably are your ideas. Um, and uh, um, again, I'd like to emphasize it's only by collaborative learning and collaborative endeavors that, that we can make any of the sort of progress. But I'd like to thank you for any questions.